every successful person got there by going through tough times. Success is a hard-ass teacher who likes to knock you around along that journey. You know, it takes real guts to not give up and keep going. We'll hear stories about failures and how these leaders flip the script to create success. I'm John Schultz. Join me and let's discover how success is never really overnight. So welcome to the John Schultz podcast, where we talk about the myth of overnight success. And we have Kara Golden, an amazing, amazing person to be on my podcast. I'm very excited. She's the CEO and founder of Hint, but she, you know, she has an unbelievable history. I love her history. So let's talk about, you know, your, your two market uh, uh, job where you, you basically moved across the country and obviously this was a Steve Jobs spinoff. And you went from sort of a corporate world, right? Where publishing and sort of everything's organized and this is your job description to a startup. And what were some of the challenges you felt uh, doing that? Well, there was, there was one kind of late stage startup in between moving to San Francisco, which was CNN. And so I had, uh, I had left publishing to move to CNN you know, it's funny, I think I loved news and, and I had been working at, at time at, at that point. And it was uh, when I started thinking about kind of the world of news, everybody at that time in the early 90s was thinking about, you know, network news, ABC, NBC, and it was tough. It was tough getting jobs there. I mean, that was like gold standard. So one day I got a recruitment call from this company called CNN. And they said, have you ever heard of CNN? It's in about 40% of households. And I lived on the Upper West Side and I had a lot of buildings around me. Uh, and the only way that I could actually get reception was to have cable. And CNN came with my cable package. And so I, I knew what CNN was and I loved it because I could turn it on whenever I wanted to and get the news. And um, but it was, you know, only 40% of households. It wasn't outside of the U.S. yet. I mean, it was definitely talk about kind of a beginning story and not sort of knowing where I was at the, at the time. But I remember going from a culture of very buttoned up at, at time to uh, to CNN where Ted is wearing, you know, a suit with cowboy boots. And I grew up in Arizona. I still had never seen anybody wear a suit with cowboy boots until I saw Ted Turner um, doing that. And I think for me it was it was um, it was kind of watching my first experience with an entrepreneur at that that was putting stakes in the ground around an idea. Some days we thought that CNN was going to happen, but there were many days when we were thought, I don't know. Like I mean, this is just really hard. We're getting killed. But Ted would always hold on to those reins really tight and and say you know, this is going to happen and look how we're moving up. He had the vision and we were his support system. And I think for, for me, I look back on, on that time as, as two things, not only seeing different cultures and how, um, you know, rolling up your sleeves at every level, uh, having a founder that is a little cuckoo, right. But has the vision and here's where we're going. And, doesn't have a roadmap, but you know, you believe because that's what they're doing um, to, um, to to really kind of seeing the traction. Then I moved out to San Francisco. Can I ask so one question about Ted? Because I find this interesting. So yeah. the roadmap as any startup is what you think it is today. And it usually changes and it's never what it ends up to be. Right. So was the belief system like did you feed off his belief system? Like like what carried you through that? Was it his belief that started making everyone believe? And do you feel that's an important uh, leadership quality? Yeah, I mean, I think a founder energy is just like, if you've never worked inside of an office where there is a founder, it doesn't mean that you're working directly for a founder or um, it, there is a belief system. And there are plenty of people who don't buy into it, right? But then the people that are there 
it's not to say that they're working for free. I guess some people in the early days might be working for almost free, but they, there, there's an energy and a, there's a magnetism about them that, that creates this, okay, here's what we're going to do. And, and like, it's going to work. Right. There, there is a piece of every single entrepreneur that if you get them, I don't know, you give them a couple of beers or you, you get them in, a, in the right room, they'll say, I don't really know if it's going to work, but, but this is where we're, this is where we're going. And I hope it works. Right. And they'll have those dark days, but they'll believe most days that it, that it's going to work. But I think that, you know, that's really what I've seen in every single entrepreneur that I've worked for or been around, um, certainly, you know, dissecting me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I always said, I never, I, I never really thought about being an entrepreneur until I started working, um, started working for entrepreneurs. I thought, oh, maybe that'd be kind of fun, but I never really thought I was going to take the leap. But looking back, you know, everything from working at a toy store or um, setting up my own kids camp, actually before my job at, at uh, a toy store, you know, being able to lead and be able to take people in a direction where you don't really know the roadmap. Um, you've got, again, this, for some reason, people are following you in, um, but, it, you know, you've also got the ability to say, okay, this isn't working, we're turning around, and some people will leave, but most people will stay. Those, right. That's the sign of a great entrepreneur and, and what I was lucky enough and fortunate to be able to work for. So, well, and, and I think you, I, I think it's very hard to teach someone to be an entrepreneur. I think, you know, it's either partially in you and it can be brought out more. But like, listen, you started working when you were 14. I mean, you could have gone to camp or you worked and you, and you, you worked. Uh, yeah. So it's always been in you. Uh, and it has. And, and I, again, I think, you know, one of the, hopefully we can get to it too, but I, I mean, one of the stories we talk about in the book too, is my dad never called himself an entrepreneur. Um, yet he was, I mean, he was developing products inside of a large company and was very, he was a frustrated entrepreneur and, yeah. he, and he should have been an entrepreneur, but you know, back then when I was growing up, I mean, entrepreneurism, I mean, I don't know, maybe Ron Popeil was like the only sort of guy that like you really viewed as an entrepreneur that he made it. I mean, you weren't talking about, um, you know, the founders of Hewlett Packard. I, I, they weren't like the, the cool people, right? They were just the, the unusual people. And not, not to, uh, so on the daunting part of that, <laughs> which is why you wrote Undaunted, by the way, Undaunted, I read it. It's unbelievable. We'll, we'll talk more about that too. It, it's such a good read, such great stories because everything in life is about great stories. But, you know, I feel at any company, you're innovating at each position and you are the Einstein, the innovator. Like you can innovate anywhere. It's just, you know, are you willing to step out at certain points in your career, your life? And some it, people it's made for and some people it's not. And you're fun. But, but your father's actions created you because you saw his answer and you didn't like his answer, which is, I don't think I can do it or I'm you know, afraid to go out and do it, whatever the exact words were. And now look what you've done. You've created something amazing in the world. So, yeah. Uh, well, and, and I think that he also, he wanted to have a bank in back of him, right? That was, right. That was constant, right? Yep. He had five kids. I was the last of five. Yeah. Had goals. Uh, I think by the time he figured out that he wanted to really be an entrepreneur, um, he he couldn't. Right. He, you know, and I think like that's the thing. There's no great time. And what I say to people, it's like when you don't actually have a house payment or a bunch of kids. I mean, it's probably the best time to go and take those risks because as life moves on, I think most frustrated entrepreneurs will say uh, that, you know, they should have done that. And that's yeah. the worst thing in life to, to live with, I think. And, and uh, so anyway, but, uh, but getting back to, to yeah. market, when I, when I came out to the West coast, uh, you know, the, another cultural sort of uh, 
not really shocked, but I, something I loved was that everybody was wearing jeans. Like it sounds crazy, but I, and they could actually do their job. I mean, I think it's, you and I were talking before about how has COVID, you know, changed environments and, and uh, the future of work a, a little bit. I mean, no, nobody would wear what they were wearing in Silicon Valley that I had been. Nobody in New York would wear jeans and t-shirts and you could actually go get your job done. Um, but the other thing I remember when I picked up the phone and got an informational interview at to market, um, and then suddenly they were offering me a job, uh, in this informational interview to come and run business development for them, help them figure out exactly, um, what the business model was for making money. It was a bunch of engineers and product guys that had worked at Apple had worked for Steve. Uh, I remember this question that I was asked that I had never been asked before, and that was, uh, do you think you can, um, it, it, what do you think you can add to the mix? And do you think you can add to the mix? And, um, and I remember thinking, I wish everybody would ask that question because I think it's one where you, it, when you are asked, you really think about whether yeah. or not, yeah, and I think it really goes down to, to do you have the curiosity um, and, and the interest to be able to add value, right, to, to the situation. Um, but I love the idea that it was less about, here's what the job is. Instead, it, it was about, uh, do you think you could join us and, and help, which, you know, that, that to me is the future of, of work at any stage. Well, they, there was no bureaucratic process at that point, right? Because it was a startup, right? It was just, they, they were building their team and, and how can you help? I think is, is a great way to, to, to ask someone before they join, right? Where, where can yeah, they and, value? And I think that they really, to me, that question also asked, um, they were making a statement saying, we think you can, but we also want to make sure that you think you can because if two parties you know don't love each other it's not gonna work right? right if there's an imbalance there in some way maybe it, it lasts for a while but it doesn't it, it, it sort of doesn't come to the place where you both are able to grow and they really needed people who were gonna not only work hard but actually be able to think hard about what how to how were they going to be able to grow this, which was, was amazing. And again, I mean, I, I took the first, I took the job, not really knowing, um, exactly hoping that I was going to be able to contribute, but not really knowing whether or not I was going to be able to, to do that. And even thinking back on it, it's interesting. It was almost like, it was probably like my first gymnastics meet, right? Like I, I didn't sleep for like, two nights before because I was thinking, what did I just get myself into? <laughs> but it was, um, but you know, as I started to get traction and as I started to really um, show up and think and all those things that you need to do ultimately um, as, as an entrepreneur, it was a great place to kind of get my um, confidence, get my training wheels, um, become a better leader, um, asking some of those questions, all those, all those kind of things. And, and basically, you know, we were building out this shopping disc and, uh, while I didn't work for Steve jobs, these people all did work for Steve jobs and kind of the training and the thinking that they had experience was, you know, very much anyone who's read stories about Steve, very much how he thought about things and, you know, that, that it's not that things can't happen, it's that they haven't happened yet. And uh, and so there was this thinking, if we just keep thinking about it, if we keep talking to people, if we keep trying, um, that'd be so cool. Um, but it wasn't, it, it, we never had this language of it, uh, that, that I saw at two market that was like, that's impossible. And so after, one of our investors, America Online, acquired us. I joined America Online. Um, America Online was a whole different culture than what I had been with at, at Two Market, um, and it was bigger. It was a later stage startup, different from 
uh, from CNN as well. But I think listening to Steve Cates um, at the time when we were acquired too, they weren't the leaders. I mean, CompuServe and Prodigy, these online services, you can look back in history <laughs> and remember those companies. Um, you know, AOL was, I mean, we were like the underdog, right? It was like, we were prettier, we, you know, like it was more graphically interesting. Um, you could but, look the weather up. I mean, you could actually like do something at that point. Yeah, but there were these cool <laughs> things like, you know, ICQ, the chat, there was, you know, your brother, like if you got on the phone when you were doing in the chat, like, you know, then you got disconnected. There was, just, you know, there was just like, there was a lot of like fun stuff that made it talked about, um, I guess is, is the key thing. Um, but it was also the first real rocket ship that I had seen um, that we were just adding people constantly. And I was running the direct to consumer business there um, for, uh, for e-commerce and, and shopping partnerships. So essentially, I think that the other thing that I learned really, like I, I would say going back to even CNN days, but that continued at two market and then at AOL was that being able to simplify things no matter what someone's experience level is, whether they've been in something or, um, or, you know, they've, they have no experience in an industry has been something that I think I've honed well, that being able to tell stories that are relatable to people, um, you know, even in the case of building out shopping, I mean, I, one story in there, a uh, major retailer that I was talking to running multi-billion dollar uh, retailer just did not understand the internet. And I mean, it was like, you have a choice. You can make somebody feel stupid at that level, or you can be grateful that you're in the room with this person and you can teach them and you can simplify it and say, think about this as, you know, Westfield Mall. That's exactly what we're doing here. And so if Nordstrom's is in and you want to be by Nordstrom's, then you should be here too. And so coming up with these, you know, analogies, I just found were, were really what built what we did. I mean, we had a great product, but also being able to communicate with people in a way that made them understand and buy into it, I think was something. It was a huge part of this. It's sort of like what's going on right now with NFTs, crypto, the metaverse, right? Like we know the metaverse is one big game because the, the it's really the gaming industry created metaverses with their games. They're closed. So it's almost like I feel that's where that is. And, you know, our generation, my generation, I won't, you know, put us both in that statement is trying to learn it, but it's not, it, I could see how people felt that were these large corporations going, oh my God, the internet, like what the hell is this? And how, how do I actually change my philosophy of how to do business on this new thing? It's, it's, and you gotta be, you gotta be willing to do it. Uh, yeah. And I, and I think like the other thing, I mean, NFTs are, are a great example. I mean, the other thing that I was able to see, I was always really interested in entrepreneurs and even some entrepreneurs of industries that I didn't really understand. But I also found that if, if there were companies that got so big that they couldn't change, then that would, that would, that created a next fire for them. And I was, I was living it and I was watching it. So I was watching, you know, digital, for example, digital photos where, you know, we went to Kodak a bunch of times and said, listen, you should work with us. We should go online. We should um, work with you. And they're like, no, people, people just want film. They're really happy with film. We don't need digital. Like, and we're like, hmm, well, there's a bunch of startups in that, you know, O photo, Surefly, there's a bunch of them cropping up. And and just saying that the consumer doesn't want that when they're already wanting it is you're creating your expire. And it was just, and it was one after the other. Xerox, IBM, I mean, the, the booksellers, Borders Books, um, just watching Amazon come up. And it was like, you could just see it happening in front of you. and. 
It's while you were there. I mean, I mean, because like literally, you were at a company that saw that happen in front of your eyes. I, I think that's fascinating. Like we're seeing NFTs and like we don't know where it's going yet, but it's sort of happening in front of our eyes too. We just really don't understand. It's all it's sort of like native online brands like Warby Parker and Untuck It now have bricks and mortar as well, but we didn't know, you know, where all that was going either. And then it's sort of morphed in front of our eyes. Yeah, no, totally. And I think it was, it was, uh, you know, I feel, I think so many people who have read the book too, just from a historical standpoint, whether you were living it like us or, um, or, you know, you want to know more about it because it helps you to understand what's in front of you, right? I mean, history does that, right? You don't have to, it's not the but, same. But if you really look at where you've been, you've been at the beginning of history for almost every industry. I mean, like if you really, CNN, it was, it was a startup, you know, this two market, I never even heard two market. Uh, and then the fact that you had catalogs and, you know, and then you were sending this disc where people then had to go to an internet that site and finish their transaction. It's, it's unbelievable to me, uh, which was, is so cool, so yeah. cool. It was really crazy. So, I, you know, I think the combination of all of those, um, I ended up leaving America Online after seven years. It was a billion dollars in revenue to AOL. And it was at that point when I really thought the key, th like I was considered a tech executive, which I was fine with, but I also sort of felt like, is that all I do? I mean, I'm living in Silicon Valley. I have lots of friends who are you know, working kind of in competitive companies, they were like, oh, you should come work for us. And then right. there was, I, I started to really, I knew the difference between, you know, early stage, middle stage, later yeah. stage, all of those kind of, you know, different stages. And I thought I definitely want to do something more on the early side, because I know that about me, that I'm a builder. I love creating, I love, you know, working from a clean slate, but I didn't know what, I didn't have an idea, which is what entrepreneurs need to have in order to start a company. So instead I just started living. I had these young kids and for me, it was, um, I was trying to figure out how to feed them. And for anyone who hasn't had children, uh, you know, I, I say this all the time that the, um, you know, the, the time when I felt the most stupid was when I had kids, when I'm trying to figure out you know, what kind of diapers do I have? What kind of food do I buy for them? All of those, um, you know, all of those kind of little things. I had done a lot of our other hard things, but those things stressed me out, right? Yep. And I think it was, it was when I finally came up for air um, from raising these young kids that I started thinking, I'm not really practicing what I'm preaching. The, the key thing, you know, for me was I drank the most uh, amount of Diet Coke over and over again on a daily basis. And it was obvious to me when I looked down at the ingredients one day that this Diet Coke, I didn't understand the ingredients. And so I thought, right. well, if, if I was feeding my kids, I wouldn't give it to them. The other thing that really kind of I got stuck on was the word diet, because I thought, you know, I've been drinking diet for many, many years, thinking that it's better for me, but maybe it's not really better for me. And when I tested it and threw it in the garbage for two and a half weeks, um, I had committed to three weeks that I was, I don't know why three weeks, I had just said, I'm gonna put it in the garbage for three weeks and see what happens. It was not a pleasant three weeks. Um, I was not a very fun person to be around. I felt like, crap. I felt like I had the flu. I was going through a detox, didn't know I was, but, um, I lost over 20 pounds, um, during that time. I, my skin cleared up. I had been fighting, um, different skin issues, including adult acne that I didn't know how to solve. And that's when I thought, well, I'm not going back to diet Coke. I'm, I'm done with it. But there was one problem remaining, which was, I, I just never liked the taste of water. Like I, I aspired to be a water drinker, but I just wasn't. And I tried bubbles, I tried flat, you know, it just, it, I don't know, it just didn't do it for me. I wanted some, something with more taste in it. And that's when I was shocked to see that there were a lot of healthy perception products in the store. 
Uh, we had this new store, Whole Foods, who had just, they had just opened up in San Francisco. And I thought this is the kind of store that would have exactly the problem, the product that I'm looking for. And they didn't have it. And so I, I did what any great consumer would do. I said, how do I get a product like this on the shelf? And, you know, the poor guy was like, I, I don't know, you know. <laughs> and then after a while, I, I just kept bugging him and said, you know, there's, I mean, how hard could it be to, to create a water and get it in your market? And, and uh, so, it's it's a story of you know what's great about this because I'm, I'm it's like this for the audience you were okay with being uncertain like through every one of the things you were, were involved in you were taught a lesson it's okay i'm certain i'm going to be uncertain during this process and you never know how it's going to work out failure is a learning lesson it's it's not an end and pivoting matters and and just creativity and ideas and it's just, I, I just find that your whole career is the epitome of, of that. And now here you are in a supermarket, right? Not being afraid to do something that most people would be like, it's too much, I can't do it. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, you know, you talked about gamifying. I mean, I, I talk about that a lot because I think that that's even before I started, you know, working, I, I think I was, I was always thinking about that. I mean, I never, my dad had one rule in our house and that was that we always had to be in a sport. And, you know, Arizona is very conducive to have lots of sports going on. And I was running and doing gymnastics and soccer and I was constantly in something. But I learned at a really early age that there were some things that I just wasn't very good at, but I still had to play them. And I, I was humbled by them and I was curious about why I sucked at certain things, but I was really good at other things. And so, you know, I, what I learned is that I would meet people. I would watch people. Softball in particular was my sport that I was terrible at softball. I just, I could not connect, but with humor, <laughs> people still wanted me on the team. Right. <laughs> like, yep. Carol will be in the dugout with us. I don't know. She'll she'll bring drinks, you know, she'll she'll do whatever. I mean, she just she has to be here. But it, it was um, but again, like I just thought you just have to show up and try, right? Who cares? And you care way more than most people care. And that's what I learned. And I think I took that into into trying to get the product into Whole Foods too. I think to some extent, I kept thinking too, that if it doesn't work out, then I go back into tech. And I remember thinking the worst case scenario is that I get, I go out, I'm at a, invited to a dinner party and somebody says, what have you been doing for the last few years? And I say, okay, I started a beverage company. And I <laughs> bet that I was the, I would be the only one who had started a beverage company. And people would sit there and and laugh. I mean, maybe they would laugh at my failure, but they would be curious about it and they would appreciate it. And I think like that was the thing that really drove me that maybe to some extent it was another story, right? It was just, who cares, you know, just go try it. Um, but I think that that's, that that is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a story of, uh, I, I recruited my husband, um, into, into the company. It was, you know, just like recruiting somebody into, uh, starting a summer camp when I was a kid. I mean, I don't know why he went along with it. He just, I think he felt sorry for me because I was pregnant with our fourth and he's an, he's a intellectual property Silicon Valley attorney. And he's, right in between roles and he had been at Netscape Communications and and uh, then I said, okay, I'm starting a company. And I mean, he was just like, wait, what? What? Why would you do this? This is a crazy idea. And, and then he's like, okay, let me know what I can do to help. And then he got the bug and he thought, wow, if we can actually do something that can really help people and can really change health not just in America, but the world by getting people off of sweeteners. Like I'm in, I, I want to be a part of that. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that? I and think so, it's amazing. It's amazing. 
and it, the, the whole story is amazing how you know talk about support and having a support system too right because even though people look like big entrepreneurs it's always a team and the people around you that help you get to where you go and you you, you say that all the time and we all we both know how true that is right it's you know cool. no one does it alone it's just there, there's always because we derive energy from people that are around us that get us through the times that are hard for us just like uh and i'm sure you've had times where you're like oh my god how am I even doing this? Why am I doing this? And you start questioning yourself. So it's good to have some support. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what were, so obviously you're, you're building this company. What would you say were the times that you almost said it's over and what got you through those? And, you know, obviously you're still here. So you got through them. How did that, how did that work for you? I think there were many points when I felt like it's over, but, you know, again, talking about working with other entrepreneurs over the years, you don't necessarily voice that. And that's why you and I are, we just figured out we're both in YPO. I mean, I think like, that's what's so great about having, you know, a network uh, outside of, your company outside of your industry even because you can think through with people how they got through challenging times or um, how they you know simplify things in, in some cases to help you think about okay well maybe i could apply those lessons over here or whatever um but gosh i think there were there were a lot of times i mean one of the stories that i that I share in the book is uh, our Starbucks story. So it's a story of any entrepreneur can appreciate this where you have this news, you know, it's like, it's the gold standard, right? You get a phone call from Starbucks and they want to put hint in Starbucks. You're like, how many Starbucks are there, right? You're, you're figuring it out and you're like, wow, you know, you're, you're counting the dollars. I mean, well, it's a, it's a, it's a real deal. I mean, it's, it's a, it's the brand you're trying to make a brand in there. It's the, one of the best brands in the market. Yeah. And you're, you're calculating it right in your head. And then suddenly you're like, Oh, it's not going to happen. It's going to be too hard. And then it goes, then it, it might happen. And then, you know, it's going to happen in a couple of hundred stores. And then, you know, somehow they decide, well, maybe if we're working with them, we should put it in a thousand stores. No, 10,000 stores. And we're like, wow, like super bonus, right? You're, you're so excited. And the first question <laughs> I asked when we get in to Starbucks, because of course I didn't want to be kicked out of Starbucks was, so what is success? And the buyer said, oh, it's a really interesting question. Most people don't ask me that question. And I said, so what is success? And they said, if you sell one and a half bottles per store per day, then we'll be happy. So I'm like, okay, we're in just over 6,000 stores. And you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's going to be great. Uh, but you know, I'm like calculating and then I'm getting these reports back from them. And then I'm seeing that by the time we hit six months, we were doing uh, three times what they wanted us to be doing. So I'm like sitting pretty and not even worried. I don't have a care in the world. I'm looking at my Starbucks reports all day long, <laughs> thinking everything's great. And then a year and a half in, I get a phone call from the new buyer from Starbucks who wants to introduce her. And I'm like, she's, you know, they're probably going to give us another spot they want us to develop products for them i mean i wonder what they're they're thinking never did i think that we were going to get kicked out of starbucks and uh so she wanted to talk to me about uh the fact that they were she was a new buyer but this came from the senior levels that they were going to remove us from the case i said you must have the wrong brand i mean you're you're not there's no way that you guys we are triple the success rate that you your previous buyer told me and she said i'm so sorry everybody likes you guys you're great blah 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 but this is what we're doing i said when are you guys doing it and she said next week 
Oh God. One week. And so I had product already made, right? I was like on the hook for this product. It was in warehouses. They weren't buying it. I mean, I was like, oh my God, we're, we're done. We have investors. We have, I mean, this is awful, right? So I, I didn't know what to say. I mean, the whole team, I think at that time, we were still a really small team, but I think they thought it's over at this point. And then I remember coming back to the office and thinking, okay, here's the thing. People who go into Starbucks, they go into the same Starbucks over and over and over again. And like, they've already been exposed to our product. And so the key thing is, is we have to figure out now that we're getting kicked out of there, how do we communicate with these consumers that we're leaving and they can buy us elsewhere? Because we were in a lot of places like in the Midwest, for example, where we just hadn't done any conventional grocery stores yet. So we didn't know exactly how to do that. And I had been thinking on it for a couple of weeks, worried about my product and expiring, going back. All of a sudden we get an email from Amazon. So this is a story of whenever there's bad, you always, you, you have to listen for the light right? It's always coming. You hope it comes tomorrow. It doesn't usually come tomorrow, but it comes. And you have to believe that. And you have to be really, really aware that it's coming. You just have to, you don't know what direction it's coming from. Here's my gamify thing as well. Like it's, well, it's like life is for you, not against you. Totally. Cause I it's, think if you, if you feel it's against you, you're close yourself down. Right. And then you can't like, you're right away. We're thinking about the next moves or right? otherwise yeah. you're going to go it's wallow. It, right. Like I owned it with our investors. Right. 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 Like yep. it's yep. not pretty. I I'm not happy about it. We're looking for other opportunities, all these things. But so the Amazon buyer said to me, uh, he said, Hey, I, I buy your product all the time. We had already been kicked out of Starbucks, of course, but he said, I buy your product all the time at Starbucks. And I'm thinking, do I tell him that we got kicked out of Starbucks or <laughs> do I just kind of go with this? So I just, I didn't say anything. I just went with it. And he said, yeah, I get my latte and get a hint. And I love the product. How fast can we get a couple of truckloads up to Amazon? Cause we're, I'm in charge of launching this grocery business um, for Amazon or beefing up. They had done a small scale, but really beefing it up. And we really want your product in there. And I said, you know, I have a, an overrun of Blackberry Hint. So if you want it, we can definitely make it happen. You just need to wire me the money. And he said, oh my God, you are saving me. This is amazing. I'm so excited. We became one of the number one products on Amazon almost immediately i mean it was it was crazy now and did they just they called you out of, they just called you out of the blue weird it was, there was no plan concerned. there was no like master plan no. and it was gold i mean that all of a sudden all the stuff in the warehouse now it's going to amazon and we got to beef up production and and so and and there were many people by the way on these early comments of blackberry hint they're like oh i buy this all the time at starbucks it took like six months for people to figure out that we weren't in starbucks anymore but after a year of, uh, of, you know, being on Amazon, that's when I was meeting with the buyer and the buyer said, listen, the thing that's so interesting about Hint is that people who are buying Hint are also doing things that make us understand a little bit more about their preferences. So like they had, they fell under this healthy halo. And, they, and healthy could mean that they eat healthy or they want to be healthier. Right. And so there were people who were buying diabetes man monitors. They were buying things in sports. Um, I mean, I was fascinated by it. I told them my story of sort of how I wanted to get healthier. And that's when uh, I said, can you give me some of these customers to reach out to? Because I'm really, really fascinated and intrigued by this. And he said, no. I said, what do you mean no? And he said, no, these are our emails. Like we, we buy. Is that them. what they mean by data is the new oil? Is that what yeah, they, is that? Exactly. Is that what that and, and so I, so this, I was like, oh, come on. And he said, no, I mean, does, does Whole Foods or Starbucks give you the data? And it was at that minute that I realized that's why 
that's why we were in Starbucks, right? It was like, there were lessons in there in Starbucks that had had me really, you know, not only did he see our product, could he have found our product elsewhere? Uh, you know, if we weren't in Starbucks, maybe, but he found our product in Starbucks. But the other thing that I was seeing a consistent pattern is if we would have had the data from Starbucks, we would have been able to communicate with our customer when we were bumped out of there. If we would have had the data from Amazon, then, you know, we would be able to have a conversation more about this topic as well. And so I remember getting on my Southwest flight from Seattle back to San Francisco. And I thought, I think we should just launch a store. And that store is just going to be our little like think tank to be able to understand what consumers think. And we'll never compete against Amazon. We'll never compete, you know, against, uh, against Starbucks or Whole Foods or whatever. I had done so an that. actual hint store, like a brick and mortar store or an online store. Well, no, an online. And, okay. and the purpose of that was to have the data and, and be able, and, and again, like it wasn't like millions of customers that that was never the goal the goal was just to have a little bit of data and also offer a place where everything we do is under one roof because these buyers who are buying our product including amazon were only buying you know five SKUs, two SKUs. they they didn't yeah. have a full selection and so i thought there are consumers who will call us in the office and say Hey, you know, I work at Google. I, I love, I love the raspberry hint, but I can never find it in stores. And so we would send it out to them, but we never had sort of a storefront at that point. And, and really beverages didn't have storefronts. I mean, you know, you have to think about, it was very limited, like how many people, more and more people, more and more startups have, have kind of sprang up that way, but not kind of brands that had gone into stores and then they start it was sort of the opposite well, it's like how you started you were you were taking your car and driving to stores to get your product on that shelf right like you like you you, you know obviously the internet just you know makes it more ability to get it from other places not just the local area but yeah and i think it's it's a story of sometimes if you you know think too much about the end i mean now i think like wait you're gonna launch a store you've got to have customer service you've got to be able to have you know content you've got to be able to you know how many SKUs do you have like i mean i think so much more but if you don't have all the answers um it's almost easier right you just go try and you just start building and you start to see how, what things work what don't work right well, because if we have all the answers we're wrong anyway most of the time right i mean I like yeah. you're saying, build the plane, you know, start while you're building the plane. Like, like just, there is no end. We don't know everything. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've been in the right direction, but not completely right on where we were going and how it was working. But because I kept going, I was willing to not be worried about if I was wrong or how it was going to end up. And I just always know I'd figure it out. Right. But and if I you don't start, like you don't have the chance. You can't figure it out. Nothing to yeah, figure out. No, exactly. And I think also, you know, as it relates to Theo, who my 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 recruit along the way, <laughs> I mean it's it's funny because like we're such different personalities and different skill sets. I think, you know, growing up in a house where we I we were always trying things. I mean, it was very entrepreneurial environment. If failure was just fine in our house, and you know, we would you know, be upset about it one day and then we forget about it and laugh and try something else. And, and it was, um, you know, very different than the house. I mean, he has very lovable parents and a great family, but they just didn't have that kind of mindset. And I think that having that balance in a, in a startup as well is really good because when you're not used to taking risks, when you're not used to sort of going out and just trying, it's really hard and it sounds a lot easier than it, than it is. I mean, you're, you know, he's very, he's very methodical. I mean, he's, you know, an attorney and, you know, he's like crossing all the T's and dotting all the, all the I's. I mean, I was just like winging it with him totally fine to live with one foot off of a cliff. And so I think like the combo 
too is always something that I share with entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs is really, really critical. Find that person who is, you know, you're able to yin and yang with, you don't have to be married to them, um, but somebody who helps you, you know, kind of re like, think about, okay, well, what's the worst that could happen? You know, is it okay if we're flying the plane and will it fly a little bit? And then we can go back and add what we need um, to it later that kind of mentality plus you're able to focus on what you're great at i mean the you know that's why there are teams you know that's why sports is sports because everyone has a position and they focus on what they're great at like you know totally. you're not gonna have tom brady be a field goal kicker like like why would you everyone says as you're in business like get better at what you're not good at no i think you got to get great at what you're great at and get greater at it right and, and that's what makes you stand out so true so, uh, so unbelievable story. And then you write this, un, you know, I see it behind you, Undaunted, which I love the title. Thank uh, you. It's a great book. Uh, how's that? I mean, again, like, are you a writer? Did you always enjoy writing? And I, I, mean, that, I always hear that process is like the biggest, hardest grind of your life. I mean, what was your experience in writing that book? How many failures did you have during writing that book, right? Like to well, get it done. It's a, it's a crazy story. Anybody who's thinking about writing a book, I, I, I was there a few years ago. Um, I kept sharing my story, a lot of, you know, public speaking and, and sitting there just sharing my story with other friends. And, and all of a sudden, I, I guess I started to realize that everybody would joke around and say, when's the book coming out? And I thought maybe I, Maybe I should actually take my notes. I, I had created kind of a journal and, and where I would share some of these stories and primarily to help me when I was um, speaking to, to audiences, kind of think about different stories. Uh, but then stories and lessons and all of that. But I thought one day, maybe I could actually take those stories and bind them. I remember asking a friend of mine who's authored a few books, a totally different category. I said, how do you think I can get, I can bind this and give it out to people? And she, and she said, you mean write a book? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm a CEO of a company. I mean, I can't possibly like write a book. When would I have time? I mean, it's very scary. It's very daunting <laughs> writing a book. I can't do that. And then she read it and she said, you probably have two books in here at least. Like, I mean, there are so many lessons in here and so a f another friend of mine had uh had an agent and i said okay book agent sound i have no idea what this industry is all about but that sounds great and this agent in particular a small agent um she said you're not ready to have a book you need to figure out what your book is about and i'm like well, it's about entrepreneurship she's like too broad like what are you good at i'm like I, I'm good at building companies too broad. Like what, what is it? And, and she was so great at, at, I, she lives in Santa Fe and I, she forced me to like sit there with her and, and really like think about it for three or four days. And it was like, it was brutal. I mean, she was telling me like, there's no lessons in that story. I'm like, no, yeah, there, there are, nope, there's no lessons in that story. That, and that was the, that was the beginning part where that's when I really started just putting an outline together. So that was a couple of years only because I was also doing a company at the yeah, same Yeah, I mean, listen, you got, you got to keep the cash flow coming in. Right. And so, um, but then finally, you know, at, at some point I was, I was doing this, we were, you know, looking at it. I couldn't look at it anymore. I, I basically was like, Okay, I want to go. I think there are people who buy books in, I mean, there's a few different ways to publish books, but I think there's people who buy books. Like there's like Random House and Harper Collins in New York. And I'm in New York a lot. Can you put me in front of them? Put me in the game. I'll go talk to them. I'll figure out what else I need to do on my book. And, uh, and that's when, you know, I learned a lot about this industry. Um, there, Interestingly, there are many publishers who believe that people don't buy books of uh, two things, entrepreneurial journeys 
and also um, female founders. They don't buy them. And I'm like, well, that's the last right. thing that person should have said to you. Right. And I, and I was like, <laughs> really? And they said, people just don't buy those books. And, and I was like, God, I mean, you must know because you see the data. I've just never really paid attention to it. But I think there's a lot of people who really want, you know, this story and, and not just my story, but I know I read entrepreneurial books and it's history and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so, but you know, once we actually got a, a publisher um, and got it into place, I, I think like, it's not just about launching a book. Now I've learned so much about it, as you know, um, you know, just being on social. I mean, that's something that I've said to, um, to many wannabe authors is like having a, having, you know, a platform out there that you can kind of create your own, um, places where people can touch your stories and engage with you and tell their friends as well. I mean, that is what makes a successful book. I mean, you got to have a great product, just like being an entrepreneur, but you have to be able to kind of get to consumers. Listen, I read it. I love the product. There it is right there. I drink it all the Thank time, you. but it was the stories. It was you that that's what interests me. I mean, it just happened to be about water. I mean, it could have been about anything, but the way the book reads, it's unbelievable. I got right through it. It's inspiring. Uh, and you should, uh, you have a great, you know, a great company. You should be very proud of yourself for what you've accomplished. And uh, I'm so happy that you were able to spend this time with me. Uh, obviously people buy the book Undaunted. Uh, it's a great book, great read, lots of lessons. I think I'm going to be giving it out to several people uh, this year. Uh, and I, I just can't thank you enough. Uh, you know, stories and, and especially inspirational ones is what, you know, someone could be listening to this and that, that one little thing helps them think through what maybe they're going through right now. And, and, and that's why I'm doing this. So I'm hoping that that will happen with this one as well. And appreciate it. And hopefully uh, we'll all have a great 22. Absolutely. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you.